And welcome to Dynavap Live. Today is May 7th and it is 4.19 p.m. Central Standard Time and I am Retail Josh. And I'm George. And uh, we have some interesting things to talk about today, such as the new Dynalures and Galaxy Glass, as well as some other topics. But first, let's do some shout outs from the chat. Yeah, I see Billy Bob from Australia. We got Mike Jackson from Torrance. And Scott Kratz from Chicago. And Johnny in Columbus. And I see uh, ah, Electronic from Germany. And we got Kyle in New Jersey and Butter Jesus from New York City. Yes. And so we want to thank you all for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed already, be sure to do so and ring the bell so that way you're notified whenever we release new content. Uh, we have almost uh, or a little bit over 100 videos on the channel, so be sure to check it out. There's lots of tips and tricks on there. Uh, helps you get the best performance out of your VAP cap. And uh, we want to thank the community for sure. It's because of the community that we're able to sit here today and uh, entertain and bring products to you as well as uh, just create a really good experience for everyone. Uh, there's yeah, the... we, we wouldn't be able to do hardly anything if it weren't for the community. Yeah, and so FC, uh, the Dynatap subreddit, Vapor Ants, Vapor Asylum, all that community support is integral to our success. And if you haven't checked out the, uh, the Dynaverse Discord, mm -hmm. That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, Pranav, if you're watching, maybe we should uh, put the invite up for the people watching this broadcast to uh, join the Dynaverse Discord. Yeah, definitely. It's a kind of a semi-closed group right now. We're only inviting a few people at a time, usually just during our live streams, to uh, join us in the Dynaverse Discord. Got some interesting discussions going on there, and we're hoping it's gonna become a really nice, friendly, community place for us to integrate and uh, interact with other people that like doing things that we like to do. Mm -hmm. And we also want to thank all the retailers out there that help get our product into everyone's hands. Uh, if you want to know uh, the authorized retailers out there, check out the where to buy section on our website. Uh, that'll give you the option to purchase locally if you prefer. Uh, it's a huge benefit to our international customers. It helps save shipping and duty costs, so be sure to check that out. Anything that you'd like to add to that, George? Yeah, support your support your local shops. Mm -hmm. You know, if at all possible, uh, especially you know, considering that uh, they might be operating under limited hours, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, supporting the local businesses, I think, is one of the most important things that we can do as members of our own community, wherever that community might be. Uh, you know, we may not think about it directly all the time, but where we spend our resources has a tremendous impact. Spend and locally, the money stays in that local economy. It, it, it makes a big difference. And then, uh, so with that, uh, we want to also mention the community tab on our YouTube channel. Every yeah. single week that we do a live stream, uh, we add a new uh, question on that community tab just to kind of get a little bit more engagement and insight into our customer base. Uh, we asked, what does spring mean to you with the options being warmer weather, gardening and flowers, passing to the new season, a flexible, resilient material, or other, uh, with the winter being warmer weather. It's definitely a nice thing with spring coming in. I wish it wasn't going to be as cold as it is going to be here tomorrow. Uh, but George, what was your vote? Uh, my vote was the flexible, resilient material. Now, since that is your favorite, what is your favorite type of spring, or thing that uses a spring? Oh boy. Springs are just such a, a useful, thing when it comes to uh, just mechanical design, I think is the way I would put it. But I have to say my favorite kind of spring is the uh, temperature activated one in the VAP cap. Great answer. <laughs> it's burning right back around. How, how useful is that? Because really it is a type of spring and it happens to flex and deform when it hits a certain temperature, and as it cools off, it springs back into its original shape. <laughs> and uh, speaking of spring, we have some spring-themed uh, glass items here, such as the Dynalure. We uh, do. Can you uh, expand upon those as to what they are and yeah. uh, where the idea came for them? So 
These are really cool kind of pieces, some close-up pictures for you to see. Uh, idea came from uh, our local glass blower, Chris Casey, uh, has made uh, variants of this uh, for a, a slightly different industry. And when he showed them to me, I was like, oh, could you uh, make that so we can fit one of our tips in the end and make it uh, a stem or a, a body type uh, accessory for a VAP cap? He's like, oh yeah. And this is what he came back with. So they really nicely resemble a fishing lure. And I think they would be nicely at home in many people's uh, tackle box. Just a cool little piece. Not much bigger than uh, a standard device. In fact, almost exactly the same length as just a body length device. And this one here, which we'll get into a little bit later, is a new variation that we have in the Galaxy Glass series. Mm -hmm. And now with the Dynalures, uh, that one looks a little bit darker. What different color combinations are available? So right now what we've got is we've got variations of green. and. You can see in these two, one's a little bit darker, one's a little bit lighter. We're just gonna put in a, a randomly selected version in your order if you order one of these. Unless you have a preference, if you do, please leave us a message in the notes and we'll do our best to accommodate. But uh, if you guys like these sorts of things, we can probably make these up in a broader range of colors. But right now we've got them in the green color range. And so, yeah, uh, let us know what you think in the comments below or in the chat. Love to see that. And then you mentioned the new uh, Galaxy Glass. I'll hand this one to you. This one yeah. is the uh, brand new gold Galaxy Glass yeah, body. Uh, we first saw this when we released the original Galaxy Glass. We gave away one of the gold ones to a lucky viewer. And now we're releasing the gold ones out into the wild. Yeah, this, this is a super cool piece. I've really been looking forward to this. Um, so, by making the Galaxy Glass, we introduced a whole new spectrum of colors and textures and just interesting variations because when the Galaxy Glass is made, you end up with some interesting blues and whites and a little bit of silver because it's made by fuming silver onto the glass. Now, when you take and do that and then you put a little bit of gold on top of it, now we get a whole new spectrum of colors and uh, interesting interplays between the gold and the silver and the silver oxide and the metallic silver and the metallic gold all kind of coming together and giving you now this range of sometimes you'll even see greenish hues uh, from the gold and the silver. Uh, you can get bronzish colors as well because uh, when you're fuming gold onto glass, uh, nanoparticles of gold aren't gold colored. They're rose colored. It's a really interesting thing how nanoparticles of gold uh, have that interesting rose color. So sometimes you'll see glass that has a rose color to it. Sometimes that color is made by just infusing a very small amount of very finely divided gold. I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Yeah. So that can help us create some of the uh, variations that you see that are more like a, a darker bronze color. Uh, because, of, again, the, the, the interplay of, of the light in the small little particles of the precious metals. And it's just kind of another interesting example of how science uh, is helping us better understand what's really going on. Because uh, the reality is, people have been fuming metals to glass for hundreds of years because of the colors that uh, you can create by doing that. They didn't know 300 years ago that something called a nanoparticle even existed, even though it did. They didn't know that some of the colors that they were creating in the glass was because they were creating nanoparticles of gold or silver or various other elements that even though they don't look anything like that color when they're in a, a macro form, when they're in a nano form, things change. Just material properties, just love that sort of stuff. So, and, and these can function with or without the condenser, correct, George, based yes. on personal preference? Depending on what your preference is. Uh, you know, in general, we try to manufacture our devices to function with a condenser as much as possible. It doesn't mean they have to run, run that way. Uh, the condenser mainly 
modifies the airflow stream a little bit to help better cool and condition your vapor. And it also helps prevent uh, condensates from getting on the insides of stems, primarily stems that are more porous, like wood, where you really wouldn't want anything in there, so it makes everything easier to clean. Yep, and I see a good question from uh, Kevin. Uh, he asked, does the body size Galaxy Glass fit the Omni mouthpiece? Yes, you just yes, want it the does. standard uh, length Omni mouthpiece and, condenser assembly. In fact, that's exactly what we have right here. And so, and then in addition to that, and I think this is a good lead in, any uh, of these Galaxy Glasses or uh, Dyna Lures will be able to function with the stainless steel tips or the titanium tips. They're backwards compatible in that regard. And we got a lot of questions on how to adjust the CCD. And so that's what we actually decided to discuss on this week's episode of The Snap. Welcome to The Snap. This is a segment where we answer frequently asked questions in a very rapid fire format. So let's get right into it. On this week's episode of The Snap, I will be showing you how to utilize the adjustable feature on the 2020M stainless steel tip. It has also been a feature that has been part of the titanium tip for some time. These steps that I'm about to show you will work with either the titanium tip or the new 2020M stainless steel tip. First, remove the tip and the cap from your device. For the M, use the digger outer of your cap to remove your condenser. For the Omni, simply just pull to remove. Ensure that the CCD is at its bottom most position. This will ensure a tight fitment when you try to adjust. So grab your condenser, cover the front of the extraction chamber with your fingertip to prevent the CCD from flying out when you're adjusting it, and push. You will feel it kind of snap right into place. You may also hear it. And now you can see I have adjusted the bowl size 50%. To do this step on a titanium tip, you simply just need to repeat that process a few more times. So here we have the TIE CCD in a titanium tip at its smallest position. If I want to enlarge that to its largest position, I just simply take the condenser. Now if your CCD is a little bit bent after trying to adjust it, really easy fix, just simply take your condenser tube and treat it like a rolling pin and just roll your CCD flat. And then It'll come out flat, just like new. When adjusting your CCD, the best advice I can give you is to feel with your fingertips. You will hear and you'll feel that CCD snap into place. It may take a few attempts, but with practice, it makes perfect and you'll get it with no issues. And welcome back. I uh, hope you liked that episode of The Snap. Uh, now we're going to take a couple questions here. Is there one, George, that you would like to answer? Yeah, right off I the see bat? the one from uh, Ubar Dog. Why do you guys make the standard M condenser different to the standard condenser? Why not make all mouthpiece ready? And this really kind of brings us back to the point in time where the M was a new thing. And before the M, all of our condensers were uh, titanium. All of them. Uh, you know, well, all of our metal condensers were titanium. Uh, the only exception to that was the glass vap cap. The glass vap cap had a glass condenser. So uh, when we decided to make the M, we wanted to make it all out of stainless steel. And since we already had a standard length condenser, the first thought was, okay, how do we make it easy to visibly differentiate between a titanium and a stainless steel condenser? Because they actually look rather similar. Once you get a little bit more familiar with the two metals, you can tell them apart by looking at it, but if you haven't looked at them before, it's kind of hard to pick up the nuanced difference between the stainless and the glass. Mm -hmm. uh, can you feel the difference in the weight? Well, barely. Yeah, because you're talking to such a small, light the, item to the, begin with. Yeah, they don't weigh hardly anything to begin with. And because of the material characteristics, in order to draw the titanium tube as thin a wall as it is, uh, we have to start and end up with a slightly thicker wall than what the stainless one has because titanium doesn't draw quite as well as stainless steel does. So the reality is the weight difference between the two is, is even smaller than what would be expected because the wall thickness in the titanium ones is just slightly thicker than the stainless ones. So by only putting two sets of grooves in the stainless ones, it makes it easier to tell them apart from the titanium ones. And that's the primary reason. Um, you know, the other thing being, if, 
if you're going to be adding a mouthpiece to an M, uh, you got to buy the mouthpiece anyway. Mm -hmm. And so we made a, a mouthpiece and condenser kit that was just a few dollars more than a mouthpiece that included the condenser. So didn't see any real downside to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gave the people the opportunity to try out the titanium. Definitely. And then I see one from Evan here. Do you guys plan to continue updating the M model? Or will you be creating different products once you feel you've perfected that line? Wow, that's that's a really good question. And I'd say at this point, do we plan on continuing to update it? And the answer for the near future is yes. Because uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, perfection is unachievable. It's a construct. It really is. It's, it's a goal. And... Uh, if we think about it from the perspective that once you make something that's functional and you prove that it's possible to make it functional, okay, we've now achieved a new level in terms of what we are able to achieve. We can basically stand on the shoulders of that and now we can see things from a new perspective and we can say, okay, now that we've actually proven that we can make this thing, uh, you know, take the glass vap cap for example, well, how do we make it better? Mm, we make a titanium tip that's modular. How do we make that better? Well, we improve the airflow characteristics. We change the mass. We move it a little bit here, a little bit there. We change the way that the cap interfaces with it. Uh, we make the cap captive. I think there's always going to be some level of improvement for every product that we make. Yes, now, as long as we continue getting that constructive criticism, absolutely. we continue to improve. And, and this is a big part of why it's so important for us to maintain this very good, uh, important dialogue with the community because it's this community engagement and involvement that helps us learn more about our product, understand things that we may not have even thought about looking into, and find new ways to improve things that were actually pretty good to begin with. Now that actually makes me want to ask a question. What is, is there a memorable case where a customer or someone recommended something that you hadn't thought of that has since been implemented? That just kind of hmm. took you by surprise off the top of your head. Uh, I'm sure there is. I'm going to have to ponder that for a second <laughs> uh, so I can think of what the specifics are. But uh, until I think of a specific example of what that is, I can say that there have been numerous occasions uh, where someone has either directly mentioned something or some other thing or action or design or idea that I've seen out there in the various social media platforms or forums has been like, ah, that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, we can build upon that. I was like, oh, I was already working on that and now you're doing it before I even got to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, induction heaters being a perfect example yeah. of that. Uh, you know, the induction heating for the uh, VAP cap has actually been part of the original plan since the very first patent that was filed, and that was years before anything about this was even public. But we can only work on so many things at a time, mm -hmm. and you know, I want to give a shout out to Pipes for actually taking the initiative to going after it and doing it. And now all of us in the community are benefiting from the fact that someone else took the initiative to go after an idea and just start pursuing it. Mm -hmm. I do see a good one from Nick Lynn. He said, can you talk about the heating of the cap versus heating of the tip? Would love to hear about which item is triggering the actual snap. Uh, that's actually one that we answer in an older episode of the snap if you want to get more information, but it's going to be the cap. The cap is your the brain of the VAP cap, if you will. Right. That's... So if you take a cap off, and if you lightly tap on it with your finger, and I'm going to mic right here, you can hear a slight little rattle. And... Basically, what you're hearing rattle is you're hearing the, the temperature indicator inside the cap rattling. Okay. So, the thermostat, believe it or not, in this tiny little cap that weighs less than one gram, there's a relatively accurate thermostat. It's just a, kind of a marvel of engineering, really, <laughs> that, that it's possible to put a thermostat in something this small and this lightweight. And, and accurate and consistent. And, and accurate and couple it with some, uh, we'll call it creative machining to produce a functional device that's capable of 
doing what it does accurately, repeatably, and consistently without the need for batteries or electronics. And then uh, this kind of leads into heating. Uh, anyone see a random spark when the click happens? What causes that, George? What causes that is the rapid transition of the shape of the temperature indicator. Because when the, the cap clicks, that click is happening because the, the temperature indicator in there is actually changing shape. Uh, it's got a slight dome to it when it's at room temperature. And as it heats up, it starts to flatten out and eventually it completely inverts and the dome goes from being convex to being concave. And when this inversion happens, it actually happens in approximately one hundred thousandth of a second. So it's extremely fast. And so if you have any little bits of dirt or debris or anything that's on top of the cap, when that click happens, it sends a, a vibration through the cap and it can dislodge a little bit of something that when that little bit of something with almost no mass hits the flame, it almost immediately gets uh, elevated in temperature to a point where it's incandescent and kind of glows. And there's your spark. Excellent. And then there's one from uh, Genya. Uh, why isn't the tip made to attach to the stem using a screw thread instead of O-rings making it truly field autonomous? You know, I really like that question. And I think uh, the, the best way to answer that is because, number one, uh, threads, they fail. They just fail. And not that threads are a bad way to incorporate things, but for something like this, we're, we're not trying to physically hold weight, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we don't need this to be on super tight. Uh, in my opinion, threads are not the best option. And there's two other really important reasons. Uh, because threads are widely utilized, in especially a lot of the battery-powered vaporizers, mm -hmm. okay, to attach things. And for any of you that have ever had any of those, have you ever cross-threaded it and damaged your threads? Oh. Okay. And if you've done that, well, if you cross-thread a, a VAP cap tip and you damage your O-rings, well, the good news is they're super easy to replace. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the other two main reasons is the threads give you a much more direct uh, thermal conduction of your heat. And things have to get pretty hot right here in order to function. And when we've got a direct coupling via threads, you end up with more of the heat going from your tip into your body or your stem, which is not desirable. So the O-rings almost act as a buffer? The O-rings function as a, as a thermal break or an insulator. Uh, so you don't have a direct metal-to-metal -metal connection for heat to con conduct through. The other reason is actually, I think, the most important one. And that is, how would we thread this? Mm -hmm. okay. You lose a lot of that modularity okay. aspect. And not only do you, you lose the modularity, but the person that makes this, say it was made out of wood. How do you thread wood? So all of the amazing, creative, aftermarket, makerspace accessories and stems that other people have made would be much more difficult if the tips were threaded. Then they have to either figure out a way to thread their, their, their body or their stem or their accessory. They would have to buy a threaded insert or make a threaded insert it just makes the overall construction of accessories more complex. And then it also runs you into the possibility that your threads could get locked. Mm -hmm. Okay, If it gets cross-threaded, if it gets too tight, uh, if it gets mo uh, manipulated a little bit while it's hot and it cools down and things can kind of get locked in there. A uh, little bit of dirt or debris. I in my opinion, although threads are extremely useful on many things, especially bolts. Mm -hmm. In this situation, I don't think they're the best choice. It could be surprisingly easy to cross thread as well. I used to work in tire and battery, and mm -hmm. that was one thing that we'd see quite uh, often. Oh, someone cross threading their lug nuts. Exactly, and then you end up without a car and until you, you get do? that fixed. And it just, it's a fail point. And if you can avoid it with a uh, more affordable uh, solution that is allows for modularity, why not? Well, then and that's the biggest point is this allows for simplistic modularity. Because, uh, again, could we make threaded inserts so that you could still use wood? And the answer is definitely. But it's just it's one more thing that needs to be done and coordinated and sourced and adapted. It's more challenging. 
And I see one from Jesse Palmer. Okay. Uh, how long to get customer support? Uh, ordered on the 27th and no updates. Uh, just email me personally at josh at dynafap.com. I'd be happy to take a look at that for you. I know that there was a slight issue with getting some tracking emails out. More than likely, your order is already shipped and on the way. Uh, but I can take a look at that. Just send me that email with your order number, and I'd be happy to look into that for you. And so while we're talking about that, Josh, let's touch on customer service a little <laughs> bit. Because, you know, occasionally we see posts on Reddit of people complaining about our customer service. Mm -hmm. And believe me when I say this, and I'm sure you'll echo it, <laughs> These posts really trouble us because mm -hmm. we are striving to do our best to not only respond to all of our customer service inquiries as quickly as possible, but to just answer all of them and do our best as a company to provide everyone out there with hopefully the most amazing experience they've ever had buying from a company like ours. However, it seems like technology can sometimes not be our best friend. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying that, I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking collectively, all of us here in the community. Because sometimes the problem, and please don't take this like I'm saying it's not our problem, it's collectively all of our problems. Because sometimes the problem is on your personal computer and your cookie setting. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's not always the case, but we've had quite a few customers that have reached out mm -hmm. to us, and it turns out that the messages that they thought they were sending never sent. It's not that we didn't receive them, because we didn't receive them, it's that they didn't even depart. So we didn't even have the opportunity to respond. So. If for some reason you're reaching out to us and it's not coming through, we have multiple other channels that we're trying to monitor. Uh, they're not our preferred ways, but we've got, we monitor our Instagram and our other mm -hmm. social media. Please use our contact us form first on our website. But if you're not getting a response, please don't get upset and make a post online. Please reach out to us in some other means and give us an opportunity to solve that problem because that's, we like nothing more than solving problems and making for happy customers. Yeah, reach out to me on Reddit. My username is Dinah Josh on there. Typically when I see that, I try to get back to you within the hour. Sometimes it might be the end of the day, but I try to get back to everyone as quickly as possible on that. That's another avenue to reach me. Right. We, we really want to maintain the interface with you out there as our customers. And I, I think you'd really try hard to try and find anyone that actually thinks that we are avoiding them. We don't mm -hmm. do that. We want to address every single question, every inquiry to the best of our ability and you know, try and make sure that uh, you're getting the experience that you're looking for. Definitely. And then uh, I see one here from Corona J871. Can I use my low temp cap and my new 2020M? How will this interact with a new tip? I think that's a very good question. It's gonna interact uh, at a lower temperature. But uh, is it going to work? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so, although we can't do this 100% of the time, we strive as a company that when we're working on iterating or improving or just simply modifying our products, especially our existing product lines, we really want to do our best to maintain as much backwards compatibility as we possibly can. And this was a huge thing for us when uh, we decided to modify one of the components that has really seen almost no modification since the beginning, other than maybe a little bit of a logo update, and that's the cap. And going from the standard cap to the captive cap, can we make a captive cap that works with most, if not all, previous generation tips and devices? And I think we were able to achieve that. And at the same time, the 2020M tip that works really well with the captive cap, will it work with regular caps? And I think it also does, so this just gives us one more way that we can modify and adjust and just customize the device for the experience. Mm -hmm. And then I think now is a good time to kind of go into one of our other topics that we wanted to discuss is uh, it going into spring. You and Pranav went on a little excursion the other day. We have some photos here. You may have seen it on the Instagram. Yeah. Uh, so what were you and Pranav cool. up to? So we were looking for mushrooms. Uh, it's kind of a fun thing to do this time of year, go out in the woods and look for some edible mushrooms. And so we weren't able to find very many, but we did find a few. Um, Were you looking for primarily morels? Our goal was to find morels, and uh, we found a few, not many, not very big. But, you know, something's better than nothing. 
Uh, it was Prav's first time in the woods. And then we also found these, which are called pheasant back, uh, which is another type of mushroom that also likes to grow on uh, dead elms very commonly. And so that was kind of cool. Um, but we ended up with a little bit of a challenge after we went out in the woods, found these mushrooms, harvested them, and uh, we're driving home, going to cook them up, and uh, we ran into a little bit of, I don't know, a, a little difficulty on the way home. That's one way of putting it. Could yeah. you expand upon that a little bit? Uh, well, apparently there was someone that uh, really badly wanted to meet us and uh, kind of forcibly introduced themselves to us uh, on the drive home and uh, kind of wrecked our car. So... Yeah, that's why Pranav's not with us today. Yeah, so it was it was a bit dramatic. And uh, so we've got a couple pictures of that, too. That was kind of part of the news. Here's a little bit of footage from uh, from the onboard camera. Uh, as you can get, there's the tire kind of rolling next to the car. Uh, all the airbags deployed. Uh, this was pretty intense. Yeah, uh, I, I can imagine. We, we were probably going uh, 50 miles an hour or so because just was not expecting uh, the guy to not only cross the center line, but I think if I'd have been going a little bit slower or if I'd have uh, been, uh, say, going down this road a second later than I was, he would have went off the road on my side if you didn't finally realize it and correct it. So I, I don't even really know what was going on. I actually feel for the guy because I don't think he's feeling so hot right now. Yeah, I know you're feeling a bit uh, sore as uh, is Pranav. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, glad I'm that you guys stiff. are both okay. Uh, you also brought in a little bit of a uh, souvenir from your experience as oh, well. Oh yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. Uh, it was a hell of an impact, you know. Here's part of the wheel. <laughs> it. I don't know how often it is that wheels actually break. Uh, it takes a lot of force to be on, on, uh, on impact, but this thing shattered. And that's why uh, there's some more pictures here. If you want to kind of peel through them. Oh, that one's, that one's cool. Uh, so what's the context of this photo? So after all this had happened and after I'd gotten out of the car and walked around and made sure everyone that was in our car was generally okay, walked over to the other guy that decided to hit us and uh, thankfully he was still alive. Uh, he wasn't in as good a condition. Made sure emergency services were contacted. Uh, they came and got him out of the car and uh, took him away and they asked us if we wanted to uh, go get checked out. And although I really didn't feel like it, uh, they convinced uh, Pranav and I to get in the ambulance and take a ride to the hospital to get checked out. And Pranav says to me, hey, look at the clock. <laughs> and I'm like, no way. How is it that the clock in the ambulance is at 419? Well, and here's one other thing, too, to give a little bit. Now, it wasn't 419 when you were in there, was it? No, that's the funniest part. So apparently, because uh, uh, the, the, the incident actually happened at about 730 in the evening, because we just been in the woods, you know, collecting mushrooms. We're on our way back to cook them up. And it was probably a good 45 minutes afterwards when they, you know, just finished talking to uh, the police and uh, the EMS. And they're like, yeah, why don't, you, why don't we just go and get you checked out? Because it's going to be a lot harder to get into the hospital if you decide that, uh, you know, something isn't quite right. And you're probably going to really start feeling it after the adrenaline wears off. It's like, all right, get in the ambulance. It's probably 8.30, quarter to nine, maybe nine o'clock. And I look at the clock, like, that just doesn't make sense. Apparently the clock stopped at 4.19. It just, so that they ambulance is always 4.19. <laughs> Apparently it's just, I don't know, I'm just gonna consider it a sign. <laughs> but yeah, that was, uh, when I heard the news, it was definitely alarming, but I'm glad you guys are okay and yeah, it, it, it's definitely can be a traumatic experience for sure. It, it really can. And 
you know, it, uh, it's just one more opportunity for us to kind of take a breath and realize that, you know, our time here in this uh, universe is, is limited and could end at any moment. So I think it's important that we're kind of thankful for who we are and what we have and who we know and how we interact with them and just generally be appreciative for uh, what we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't have a dash cam, I would actually strongly encourage you uh, considering looking into it because they're not very expensive and uh, having that video footage is, is really useful. Yeah, it makes things a lot easier when it comes to insurance time. Yeah, and, and just making sure that uh, you're, you're protected. Mm -hmm. And wear your seatbelt. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think that the, the three of us that were in the car would have so easily walked away from that uh, impact if we hadn't no. been wearing our seatbelts. To kind of give some insight here, like if you look at that footage that was rolled, you can see the wheel come rolling yeah, uh, after the impact. An object in motion wants to stay in motion, just like Boom. that wheel did. And there's the tire had, uh, rolling off the shattered rim. Had the seatbelt not been there, you would have been... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we'd have been right through that way. Yeah, so. without a doubt. Um, but yeah, I saw some there. And then, uh, Ben, if you can scroll up, there's one question there I saw from Devin Oates that I'd like to answer. Uh, right here. So this is one that uh, I think both you and I can provide some insight. Uh, does the 2020M take longer to heat on purpose? I think it is somewhat more common to heat the 2020M longer than previous iterations. Okay. So, uh, yes. It does take longer to heat, and it does take longer to heat on purpose. Uh, we found uh, during the initial beta testing that, because uh, we're trying out various different fin designs, and really kind of liked the way that the, this newer profile looked. It was a little bit different, but it was generally similar to what you see now in the production model. Uh, it looked good, but I was concerned because there was more mass. And I remember looking at it, so there was more metal there. So weighed this tip, weighed last year's tips. Like, it's actually quite a bit more mass in there. But whatever, you know, a big part of development is trying to set your prejudices aside. And I'm not talking about what you think of other people. I'm talking about what you think about anything. That's, that's what a prejudice is. It's, it's Go in with an open mind and be right. objective. So I didn't think it was going to work as good. I thought it was going to cause a problem having that extra mass. Send it out and just start getting feedback from people without letting them know what's really changed. So it can be as objective as possible. And uh, some of that feedback was, yeah, it takes a little bit longer to heat up, but I really like it. Because uh, a lot of this development uh, for the M's is done during colder weather, and so mm -hmm. people were finding that hey, this works much not, much better outside during the colder weather than the previous one did, because that extra mass helps it hold the heat longer. So it's always a trade-off and it's a balance. So, yeah, we're talking about one to two seconds longer to heat it up to temperature, but it holds the heat a little bit longer. So it's great for colder weather, and it's also good for someone that's looking for a little bit longer or larger of an extraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's great for when you use it in a water piece for that reason. Right. Uh, because one of the things that we would see uh, commonly are people where they say that they would like to, they prefer to use the stainless steel uh, tips with water pieces due to the higher heat retention. Right. So there's one other tidbit I'd like to touch on. Uh, the question was actually heating past the click. Now, when you buy this device, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. But I would encourage you to modify your technique just a little bit because there's rare circumstances where it should actually be necessary to heat past the click. The whole point of the click is to give you that temperature indicator, right? That, hey, I'm at temperature. And so if you're not quite getting the temperature you want, instead of heating past the click, heat a little bit lower on the cap. Heat a little bit further away from the groove. And or heat the cap a little bit stop for a few seconds and then heat a little bit more and what this does is allows for more of that heat to soak in because there's a lot of complex thermodynamics going on inside of here and heating everything up too fast well it changes the way everything works and this is the same thing for induction heaters where people are heating past the click if you were to simply 
pulse it on and then give it a few seconds and then pulse it on for a second or two and then a few seconds. Draw out the time that you're heating it up to allow that heat to equalize throughout more of the tip and the cap. You're going to find that you're going to be able to get more repeatable and more consistent results on your device whether your tip is cold or you just got done with a heating cycle because otherwise if you're heating past the click two, three, four seconds on a cold and it's just right, now you're reheating it when it's already hot two or three, four seconds you might find yourself in the combustion range mm -hmm. because you've pretty much bypassed the temperature indicator. So. Yeah, typically when uh, I know combustion happens it's usually when you're trying to push it that little bit extra, a little bit too far at just the right time and then you end up with a not so tasty draw. Yeah, not so tasty. Uh, there's a great question here from Jenya again. Uh, does the airport of the M function as a diffusion vacuum pump? Does it mean that drawing fast is best for efficient diffusion of vapor into the airstream? Should the draw pace vary throughout the draw? This is really good stuff. And the answer is to a certain extent, yes. Okay. And this becomes a lot more noticeable on two devices. The Hydrovong, which was the first one, with the offset and elongated air port, okay? And then secondarily on the 2020M with the, the, the dual air ports, also elongated. Because as you draw harder with the air ports unobstructed, what ends up happening is the velocity of the air coming through those non-round air ports starts to really play some interesting things as it starts to automatically restrict itself to some degree. Okay, so changing air and vapor ratio. Also, on the devices that have a condenser in them, um, the air coming in the airport is moving away from your mouth towards the tip, where it then has to go around the condenser, do a 180 degree turn before it picks up the vapor and then draws it through uh, as a combined mixture through the condenser, imparting a whole bunch of turbulence. So this is going to give you more cool and more conditioned vapor. And that's a great answer. I thought that was a great question. And if you're okay with it, George, I think it would be a great one to choose for a winner of a galaxy glass body. Yeah. In fact, uh, I agree. And, and so, Jenya, reach out to Karen at Dynavap.com, and we'll get that out for you soon. Yeah. Nice gold, galaxy gold with a little bit of silver in there. It's just all kinds of cool things going on. And then I think we'll take one last question here, and then we'll... Uh, sign off for the evening. Uh, Nicholas Burns asked, what temperature is the cap designed to click at? <sighs> the right one. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a range. And, and you know, and it's, and I'm not trying to be too facetious here, but the, the reality is the temperature indicator in the cap is the temperature indicator in the cap. It's not a temperature indicator in your extraction chamber, okay? Mm -hmm. So, what it's doing is it's giving you a general indication that since there's something right next to the cap, this thing is probably close to the temperature that you want it to be when this thing says, hey, I'm going to click. So the temperature in here is not the temperature that this thing clicks at. They're relative to one another. They're not the same. So. A good analogy for those of you who have ever baked inside a Dutch oven mm. is you may put it in a 450 degree oven. That doesn't mean that the contents inside are going to be that temperature. Right. Well, in, I'm glad you say Dutch oven. Uh, the Dutch oven was really not designed to be put initially in an oven. Mm -hmm. It was designed to be put in a fire or to have a lot of Dutch ovens have a, a, a lid on them with a ridge or a large tall rim. And that's not just there for structural integrity. It's there to hold charcoal or coals from your fire that you could scoop out and put on top of the lid and hold them in place so you could get that heat being conducted and directly into the cooking vessel. And charcoal burns at a much higher temperature than your food necessarily needs to cook. So there's temperature differentials and temperature gradients on everything that we encounter on a daily basis. And even thermometers, uh, you know, they're, when we look at them, they're measuring the temperature of the air, but this is the temperature of the air there, not here. So they're just general indicators of about what the temperature is. 
And so that was a great question. So thank you very much, Nicholas, for asking that. And we want to thank everyone for tuning in. We will see everyone again on May 21st at 4.19 p.m. Central Standard Time. We want to thank Ben for working the questions this week and Bryce behind the camera. And all those uh, tuning in at home, be sure to check out the Instagram page. That's at Dynavap. And then subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring the bell to be notified whenever we, re we release new content. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. For more videos, click here or here, and don't forget to subscribe.